This is the second and last video of the series System Design for Massive Multiplayer Online Game Systems. My name is Narin and in this session, let's concentrate only on the backend systems for Massive Multiplayer Online Games. And here is the high level system design for Massive Multiplayer Online Gaming System or session based multiplayer games. Before I jump into explaining the each and every individual component, I'm going to explain you the high-level working of the game system. First, the clients connect to the patch server to make sure that their applications are up to date. If not, they will download the patch and they update themselves. In the second step, they connect to the login server and then they check the credentials against the database. And in the third step, players connect to the world server which then pays them together with the other players using Redis or database or any other persistent system which records the entry of the players who wants to play the game. In the fourth step, once the multiple players are joined, a game session is established. And in the fifth step, the game server will create a new instance of the game that runs on one of the machines in the cluster. For example, if the game is simple, like only two players are playing, like uh, billiards or chess, you don't need to distribute the game at all. But if your game is something like Call of Duty or Count of Strike, then you need to distribute your single session of game into multiple machines available in the cluster. And in the sixth step, the client then receives the game server and area server information, IP, port, etc. And in the seventh step, the clients will connect to the area servers and also to the game servers to get the information on the game or, and the players in real time. Before continuing watching this video, my expectation is that you guys have watched the part one of the series, that is how front end or the game app works and what are the uh, latency criteria, what protocol to use, whether TCP or UDP. If you haven't watched that video, I strongly suggest you to go and watch that video first. Now, let's talk a bit about load balancer. I'm not going to explain a lot, um, so from the first video, if you remember, the key to the um, high performance massive multiplayer online game system is the low latency. We know that there is an inherent limitation of speed of light, so you can't have multiplayers joining one guy from somewhere in Singapore and one guy in um, Seattle or somewhere because they are too far away. And um, you can't realistically um, make them play um, very sensitive games from these two far away distance. So you need to have a load balancer um, in place where it's it's up to you, right? You can go for DNS-based uh, load balancing or region-based load balancing. The key to the load balancing is always keep the latency between two players minimal. That way, the simple strategy is, um, say for example, if you're using AWS, you have uh, nine plus regions available uh, all over the world, right? So you you calculate the distance from uh, any given region between two players and then always make two players join um, of the nearest region. That way we always um, can exchange the information between these two players faster. So let's talk about proxy or connection server and why do we need them. Creating connection uh, like TCP or UDP incurs CPU and memory overhead. Mm. This overhead grows uh, linearly as more number of um, players connect to the system. The time complexity is, for example, order of n, where n is the number of players which are joining to the system. So, and if you are processing m number of packets per player, the total time complexity will be order of n into m. And this has heavy impact on the way uh, this server performs when it needs to do decoding, decryp uh, decryption, and decompression of the packets or the data which it receives. What happens when we include these operations along with the game operation uh, in the game server? The performance decreases. Say, for example, the games like um, you know, Call of Duty or PUBG or any other games, right? They always uh, exchange a lot of information because the player is moving, he's holding the gun, or he's shooting, a lot of other players are moving and jumping. In this case, there's a hell lot of information is being exchanged between the players. That means that there is too much of packets um, need to be processed, you know, decoding, decryption, and uh, you know, decompression. So it's too much of overhead on the gaming server. So what we need to do for, for making this uh, particular operation flexible and scalable, what we need to do is we need to 
separate out this part of processing uh, and these kind of operation into separate server. That's what the proxy or connection server does. This server will only handle um, the connections which are made from the client to the backend system. They take care of the overhead of handling the connection. Whereas the game server just performs the game logic or do the authoritative process. If you observe this system design diagram, you can see that there is world server and there are game servers, okay? You must be wondering what is world server and game server? If you remember from the last video, you also learned about authoritative server, which is the guy who maintains the game session, which also runs the game in the backend, okay? Now, I'm gonna explain what is world server and game server now. Take, for example, you are designing a chess game. In this, chess is kind of a strategic game, right? You will have at most two player, and there is a chess board with eight cross eight in it. So you don't need to actually maintain this eight cross eight um, you know, map in the backend because it is just eight cross eight. You just need to have a coordinates, right? And also the number of players who are playing the game is only two people. Now consider you have a server, which can each server can easily handle up to 1000 players, right? That means that easily we can run up to 500 sessions of the game. What if we are getting about 10,000 uh, you know, people who want to play the chess? In that case, we can easily you know, scale these servers into another, we can add another 10 or nine servers. So we can easily accommodate about 10,000 people who are running, sorry, who are playing the chess. Like two people, two people, two people, like a set of two players here, a set of two players here, here, here. But the same strategy won't work for the games like Call of Duty or PUBG or Counter-Strike. Why? Because as I already mentioned you, consider each server can handle only 1,000 players. What if I am running a game which in which there are about 2,000 players are playing this particular game? This is not a strategy game. Consider this is like Counter-Strike where there are like 2,000 people parallelly, you know, playing this particular game in a big map where this is a, some, some city map or something. In this case, how do you scale it? You can't just accommodate all of these 2,000 um, people in the server, which can host 1,000 um, players. I told you uh, each server can handle 1,000 players for chess. Chess is a very simple game, right? It is a strategy game. It's not real time. But in case of these kind of games, there is tons of data to be processed and tons of stakes to be maintained. That's, in that case, I don't think it can handle 1,000 players also. Maybe if, if we get the powerful servers, it can handle, uh, I'm just, just comparing with a chess game. Considering this kind of games, it can't handle 1,000. Uh, maybe it is handling about only 500 players of this kind of game because we have tons of data to be processed. Now, how do we scale it? Now, we can't definitely fit all the whole game session into one machine, or we have to get a uh, you know big machine that is vertical scaling. And uh, definitely vertical scaling is not a good idea. We have to do a horizontal scaling by adding more of more commodity servers. How do we do it? Now, let's do one thing. Let's break this map into four different pieces or you know multiple pieces. Say like we, we are breaking into eight different pieces. So this map is broken into multiple pieces. And then each piece is, you know, loaded onto one one server or multiple uh, you know, maps are loaded to one server. And these servers are all called as game servers. And when you have multiple servers running for the game session, you need a guy who can coordinate all of these servers. For that, we need a game, sorry, word server. And this word server maintains all of the game server one, game server two, game server three, who all uh, is responsible to take care of these different pieces of the map for the game session, uh, for the same game session. And that is the role of word server and game server. And now I will explain how the overall system works in depth. Now consider these are the different game clients available. Okay, that is client one, client one, client three. Now first, when the client one joins to the connection server, he will be forward, the request will be forwarded to the world server. And the world server as it represents is the main server who actually assigns the a particular 
player to a game session and also uh, matches to our more players onto a same game session based on the region um, which is closest okay and now once the multiple players are made to join to the game same game session and now the world server actually instantiate a game session now in between all the connections are handled in the connection server the authorization the connection creation termination and handling and everything will be handled in here and the game session is kind of actually running over here but when i say game session it's just the entry and it tracks the players and it actually orchestrates the cross region uh, you know coordination between these game server as i have already explained if you look at this particular picture how this um, image or map is broken into multiple pieces and each different pieces are actually handled by different area server and i'm going to explain area server in about a couple of minutes but now don't worry about it a lot so consider that each of these different game server are actually handling different pieces of the map and each and every objects inside that map um, and all the players uh, movement and everything but you need a single place or single source of truth about any given player for that particular game session and a kind of like where the player is and what is the health of the player, what are the weapons he owns and everything will be actually stored in here. That is the player's information of that particular game session will be saved and the game session information, a high level game session information will be saved in the world server. But the actual game runs on these game servers. Now the client, um, once he is joined to a game session, he gets two things. The first one is world server information and the second one is game server information. Why does the client needs to know both the information? Because the world server information uh, like IP and the port and etc. is needed to get the player's information because world server is the guy who actually gives the information of the players because the problem is um, you never know where the player um, is in these many uh, you know servers so client can't actually you know query all of these game servers uh, to to get the location of the players so the world server is the one who gives all this information about the players or any critical information uh, but all the different map and the objects and what's happening and what's not is all handled in here so um, the main information is available here and the game server information um, is needed uh, because you need to also show to that particular player, say if, if the player is exactly in the center of the map, that means that we should be showing the objects around it, right? So what happens is, first, the client will connect to the world server and it knows the player's position. Based on the player's position, the world server also tells the client that please contact, say, game server 1 for, for your map information or the objects around you. So that way, this client gets to know the player information from here and also gets to know that uh, I should be contacting which game server to get the information to display the objects around uh, around me or something like that. So, so basically the clients will have two connections established between um, the world servers and one more connection between the game servers. So both the information is mixed and the game uh, is represented or rendered on the game client. And also, the world server handles uh, the scaling of the game servers. Oftentimes, if the players are you know, added more and more, what happens is we might need to scale these game servers more also. So let's learn about area servers. So area servers are the one who manage the region map and control all the aspects of the game which is happening on that particular you know, region or the segment of the map. So as I've already explained, that uh, the map is broken into multiple pieces. In this case, there are like about nine different pieces of the map, or you can call it as different um, uh, segments of the map. And each of these segments can be distributed into different area servers. In this case, consider like we have three different area servers. And now we can easily distribute like three, three, something like some different strategy. Or if you have nine, different area server we can all we can give designate one uh, particular segment of the map to each and every server 
But the problem is sometimes the players will not be equally distributed in the map. Sometimes we also know that players are most likely concentrated on the most happening places in the game map. Sometimes they are concentrated, say, something like in the center of the map or um, these two areas of the map. In this case, this the load of for the server which manages this particular segment will be very heavy. So what we can actually do is just assign this one particular segment to one server and this one to this server and we can actually move all of these segments yeah this one right this one is assigned here this one is assigned here and rest of all of these segments can be loaded onto area server three so that way this guy can easily handle all the players on this segment and this guy can also handle this segment and the area server or the game server 3 can actually handle all of these segments as there are very less uh, number of players who are playing in that particular map. And also provided that uh, there is a data structure called as map template which is actually is used to model the terrain, the objects on the map. So just go and explore map template if you want to learn more. And one more important thing is singleton pattern. So all of this map and its objects are kind of modeled as a singleton pattern because uh, there can be only one copy of a map template can be available uh, for that particular game session in um, any of the servers. So singleton is actually used in here. Now you must be thinking, you know, handling a very large map centric games like this or Call of Duty or say the famous PUBG uh, is very easy. Even though you have a very big map, say even bigger map, we just need to break it down. Even though there are like 10,000 players are playing on that particular map, we can easily break and then we can horizontally scale and designate each of the segments of the map into each and every you know, game service, right? But that's not always true. Say consider this particular scenario. A player, as, as I shown in the image, a player is in one particular map and then he's trying to cross that particular region and going on to the next region. This is the backend perspective. For the player, he doesn't know what region he belongs to or what particular map template. Uh, to explain it further, consider this is your map. I have broken into four different pieces. Now there are, there is a player, so there is a player who is playing over here. For a player, he doesn't know the map is divided into four different pieces and each of these, you know, a particular uh, map segment is handled by different servers. Consider this one is handled by this one and this particular template by this guy and these two templates handled by this server. In this case, player doesn't know that these you know, we have in the back end, the map is broken into four different pieces, but the player might try to cross this region to this region, or he can go this region or this region. Because he has got a plane or he has got a tanker, he is riding fast. Now, how do we handle this situation? Because, um, so even though the world server knows the position of this particular player, uh, when, when the player moves from here to here, the word player, the word server anyway gets to know the new location and he can update. But the goal for us is to have a better, um, you know, experience for the players who is playing the game. He shouldn't be seeing the lags or glitch whenever he moves between the map. So what we need to do or what strategy we need to adopt to, you know, make this seamless transition between different segment of the maps to one more segment. So for that, we have to make, um, you know, we have to kind of broadcast the position, say if consider there is a, there's a car over here, there's a bike over here, some, some, some objects are here. So we kind of, the server who is responsible to handle this template, the map template or segment one, should also be taking care of broadcasting all the actions or the positions or different you know state of all the objects in the at least in the border i mean it's it's good if you send all of the data um, of this to the adjacent uh, you know templates servers 
so that we can always do the seamless transition because this server already knows what is the state of each and every objects in the border or this server knows all of the state um, which is there in the template one but if to send all of the information it is tedious right so one good strategy is just send the the state of the objects which are in the border so as and when the player moves to that particular border the state of the player is kind of already you know published to all these three different servers that way these servers already know that where this player is going to uh, is now and if he moves where he could be so somehow we can make seamless transition um, there could be one more good example where uh, we want to have this kind of seamless transition say a player in the you know segment one he's trying to shoot a player who is standing in the segment four in that case if you shoot a bullet it should easily i mean it should, it should, it should be going um, you know straight or it should go seamlessly and hit the other guy if he is pointed at him correctly but if you are not broadcasting the information i i don't think so the bullet can easily go on him something happens something strange and glitch or lag happens but if we are you know broadcasting all the state information in real time to all of these adjacent servers at least we know that there is a bullet traveling already by then the information goes to the server and obviously the you know the bullet is kind of already mapped on this particular server and if the trajectory is correct and it will hit the player and this player will his health um, decreased or he's dead or something like that so so this is how we you know, handle seamless transition between the templates or the segments of the maps. So, patch servers. As the name indicates, patch is like patching or sending updates to the games. So before a particular player plays the game, it is a good characteristic of a game to check for the latest version of the game available in the client or not. But this doesn't hold good if the game is independent or in a single player game which he can play without connecting to the server also but for massive multiplayer online gaming system patch servers plays a very crucial role because every player should be off uh, should be running the same version of the game because if some guy has some bugs in it i um, mean he might leverage or he might uh, suffer in the game also so it's always um, you know games um, logic we should have some kind of game logic in the game that if the game is not up to date we shouldn't let him play at all or he should get the patch and immediately he should have the very latest uh, code running in his uh, game client as you also remember that I, I mentioned in my previous video there is something like authoritative server that is the word server which actually also runs a copy of the game in the backend to make a proper decision because we can't always trust the clients because client can be hacked or client can be uh, you know automated or some kind of with kind of robots or some kind of instructions written using any any code right so so that's why we will be running one authoritative server in the back end so if you have a different version in the back end and different version in the front end they might uh, there might be a disconnection or disconnect between the state or or how we handle the player or something like that so so that's where the patch, patch server comes, uh, plays a crucial role. And also one more place, uh, which I just remember when, when one of my senior was mentioning to me that uh, patch servers also plays a very important role when on the fly, if they figure out there is some kind of uh, vulnerability in the game or there's some kind of bug in the game, they will be pushing the updates um, when the players are actually playing the game. Um, so that way we can minimize the damage which might happen to the other players. So, or if a guy uh, is trying to hack a particular uh, in a game session or game backend server, they immediately know that on what, uh, how he's trying to hack um, and he can immediately push a patch or he can immediately block that particular game client or something like that. So, okay, so that's um that's why patch servers are very important now a little bit of information on game server threats now if you see that i have already told that per client we might need to have two different connections to two different servers that means that if there are 100 people playing we will be having about 200 connections to the system so you might be thinking that to have single thread 
for single connection. That means that we'll be running like 200 threads in a system. This will not be efficient because each thread for each connection is not a good strategy. So what we can instead do is um, the kind of message we also transfer between client to server uh, and back to the client is kind of small message. We mostly send the player's information or the object state, something like that. This is somewhat similar to, you know, sending messages or, you know, messengers um, architecture, where if you want to send a lot of small information, the good thing is to use asynchronous um, async servers or Nginx-like servers or Node.js-like servers where a single thread is running, uh, which takes the input request uh, and then hands over to the backend um, IO or network IO or file IO and then gets the response back and send it back. Uh, you, can, you can have a hybrid kind of combination wherein uh, instead of having one thread, which is handling all of the you know, hundreds of connections, you can have a pool of connections which can actually handle these connections Take the request, uh, pass it on back to the you know, game server, get the response and pass it on back to the client, something like that. You can have a couple of thread pool, which actually handles hundreds of connections and gets, takes the response and gives back the response. Um, so in, in real time, in asynchronous fashion. Now let's learn some strategies on how to uh, you know, back up the game state. You can't just take a backup of the whole game session because you can't just serialize the game session. So instead, what we can do is we can serialize individual bits and pieces or objects and the players in the game. So what we can do is, first one, the fourth, first and foremost important thing is always serialize the things which are very important for the game to reestablish. We know that any server can fail at any time. So backup is very important. So what we need to save or serialize and persist it, make it persistent is very important bits. Like obviously the players are very important factor and all the objects which are affected by the players are also very important. important. So just serialize those objects and save it in some place so that if server fails or if something happens to the game session, we can just repopulate the whole session of that particular state from the persistent um, in a storage. The second thing is only if changed. So there could be tons or like millions of objects in particular big, you know, map centric games. We can't just, you know, serialize all of these objects. So if we know that this particular object was changed by interaction with some other players or some other objects, only that we can have a flag that is it changed or not. If it changed, we can have some strategy just to serialize that and save it. If not changed, we can always populate it by the, you know, by the initial state of the game. So when the game starts, every object will have its own initial state. If the, the particular object is never changed, then obviously we will get back that state um, or the object will be in the same state from uh, which was, which it was in the beginning of the game. So we don't need to worry about it. And the next thing is always try to um, cache individual objects because you can't just combine multiple objects into one serialized um, output and then save it. So you can, you always, you need to do is serialize it individually. And the next thing and the very important thing is save asynchronously. You can't just always have, have a system which saves, you know, synchronously because that is not very good also. And it's not feasible. Uh, you can't always have a system large enough or powerful enough to save each and every million objects which are you know getting affected by uh, a lot of players which are playing in the map uh, in, in real time. So what we can instead do is push all the objects which we need to serialize into a queue and you have a couple of workers on the other end which consumes this and then keep on serializing into DB or cache or someplace. So now let's know a little bit about what kind of database we need to use. This is a kind of debatable topic. I can't suggest to you exactly to use you know, SQL or um, NoSQL, right? Um, so if your um, you know, game size is very less and if your user base is very less, you can always go for MySQL. And um, if your user base is really um, crossing more than you know, a couple of millions, then it's always suggested to go for NoSQL-like database. 
Still, if you want to hold some kind of transaction information or user information where you need to have consistent data, you can always use sharded MySQL or you know, um, RDBMS kind of system. Otherwise, it's okay not to worry about it. So next thing is CDN. Okay, CDN plays very important uh, role in uh, MMO games because there is a lot of um, game sprites, you know, gameplay video or introduction videos and whatnot. So these things should be loaded in a matter of milliseconds, right? Because when a particular player is moving through some particular region which was never explored, you shouldn't be expecting them to be blank or loading in the time, right? Because um, if the game is preloaded, it's fine. If it is a like, if it is like browser-based game, then it is you can't always preload everything. It's some part of the game will be you know loaded as a sprites or something. So it's always better to use CDN, high-performance CDN, uh, to get these sprites or images and videos um, you know as and when we want. Also, CDN is important when you want to you know distribute the game. So you can upload your game. Um, into the CDN and who pays it, uh, who gets authorized to that particular cache in the CDN and they install it. So the server on, the load on your servers uh, will be a lot less and you don't need to worry about it. And also while updating also you can use, um, you know, CDNs. Updating in the sense when you're patching the game also you can use CDNs efficiently. Last but not least, logging and analysis. Logging in any of the system plays a very important role. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot of a lot about it because in all of other system design videos, I have spoken uh, enough about it. So simple answer is use Elk Stack, or you build your own using any kind of NoSQL system and um, you know some kind of visualization system on top of it. So um, something which is readily available is Elasticsearch plus Logstash plus Kibana or Grafana. You can use it. Um, directly to explore your logs and also you know game analytics is also uh, important um, again I'm not going to talk about this you can straight away use Hadoop ecosystem and use any of uh, the tools like Spark um, you know Flink um, any of the stream processing and HDFS to store the data and um, pick or how to explore the data mm. I think I've covered most of the things which are needed uh, for you to answer in the interview if the question is how do you design massive multiplayer online gaming system. I think this video should give you enough information to for you to answer. Um, okay. Nice. Uh, we have reached to the end of the series. As usual, if you like this video, please subscribe. Uh, to my channel tell your friends um, to subscribe to the channel and also if you want me to make any videos on any specific topic please drop a comment on my any of the video um, uh, page and um, yep thanks a lot and don't forget to hit the like button and also the bell icon thank you